Hello everyone. It's in Design 1. This is Week 5, Webcast 4, Creating a PDF File. And I know you're thinking to yourself, uh, really are we doing this yet again? But we're getting to the point in Week 5 where you have put enough things together that you're going to need to know in more detail about the topics that we've been covering this week, which for the most part have not really been fun um, features within InDesign. Instead, they've really been the practical foundations for sharing your work. And as a designer, a production worker, basically anyone who has to create some project in InDesign, at some point you're going to need to share that with someone, whether it's a, a coworker uh, that you have to attach to an email, whether it's uh, someone who has to see all of the quality of it or someone else who might have to work on it, or you have to send the final project to a commercial printer. And that's the reason this week has really been filled with all of those workflow pieces that you're going to need. So what this webcast is going to be about is creating a PDF in more detail. So far we've talked about creating a PDF by just going to the file menu, choosing one of the Adobe PDF presets, and then finishing it. But what I want to do today is go into more detail about how these came about and how you can create your own custom job options as they're called or PDF presets and how you can uh, – I'm actually I'm not going to go into too much detail about that – but you can also take the job options from a printer and place them on your computer so that you are following exactly the preset they want you to follow. So let's get started with this. I'm going to move to another file. This is just a two-page spread. And let's go into our PDF creation command. In addition to using these Adobe PDF presets, we have the option of going to the export command on the file menu and making sure that we print Adobe or select Adobe PDF Print. Remember, we're not quite ready for this interactive except for when you did your slide presentation, which was the first time we had gone into that command. And you notice that it has a very different interface. Right now, we're speaking with print. And I'm going to just add the word test to this because I've created several of these we're going to compare in just a few minutes. And click Save which as I've said before I think is a little bit counterintuitive because how do I know what I'm saving if I haven't been given the options? And for some reason InDesign forces you to find a file name and press the Save button and then it presents the options, which you have lots of opportunities at this point to make changes to those options. But this is how it works. So here we go. Um, as I've mentioned before, the PDF preset will be, there will be a default one sitting there, probably the last one that you used. And I use high quality print almost all of the time. So that's why it was the default in my Adobe PDF preset selection. But anything that has a square bracket around it means that that is a predefined preset which you cannot change. You can base a custom preset off it, but you can't change these. The moment you try to make a change, it's going to ask you to provide a new name. Hint, this high quality print 8 compat and high quality print oversize. These are two that I based off of the high quality print, but I made changes to it. And we're going to talk about what those changes can be right now. By the way, now that you've been looking at this window today, uh, I am trying a new resolution for my PC in doing these webcasts. The thing is absolutely enormous to me. I feel like I need to be standing five feet away, but at least on my second monitor, I'm seeing a much, well, I think a, a better representation of the elements within InDesign. So if anybody has an opinion about this, and this would be starting with the creating a PDF, this particular webcast, I would really appreciate some feedback. I am still trying to nail down this resolution business. And of course it's different on my Mac than it is on my PC because they have two different default resolutions that is best for that screen. 
um, it's really fuzzy for me, but again, on my second monitor, I, I don't feel like it's really crisp, but it's not quite as fuzzy as it is in, on this first monitor that I'm using. So anyway, just if anyone has any feedback, I would really appreciate it. All right, let's take a look at one of the tabs here. The first one is general. And uh, the general settings really just let you determine your page ranges, uh, gives you some other options for viewing and for implementing, and then of course it has some more options down here at the bottom. So let's just work our way through here. If you choose any of these other options, these presets, you will see a description to help you determine whether that is the right one. And we have said earlier that smallest file size is really only sufficient for posting on a website or attaching to an email. If you have images, those images are going to be lowered in their quality and crispness because it lowers the resolution of attached images to that InDesign file. Of course, it doesn't make any lasting changes to your InDesign file. This is just in the translation of an InDesign file to an Acrobat PDF. Moving up the scale, we have high quality print. And it says here that it is for quality printing on desktop printers and proofers, hence the reason I use this in most cases to go to my inkjet or to my laser printer in my little tiny office here. And then if you move up in quality, you have press quality, which really has the same compression setting, surprisingly enough, but it also does some other things in the background, including converting your RGB colors to CMYK. And this is the one that people most often feel should go to a professional workshop. But in fact, if you are going to a professional workshop, you're probably going to want to use one of these PDFX standards. And these are widely used for professional printing. It contains a standard set of definitions that specify requirements for PDF documents, ensuring that these will print on a professional press. 2001, so that's X1A 2001, is an older version and it is one of the most common. X3 and X4 are newer and they are not necessarily have been adopted across the industry. So this is always something you're going to want to check before you send a PDF to a commercial printer. You are going to want to have that conversation and say, hey, what do you want to see in those uh, attributes that I change when I am creating the PDF? And in some cases, they're just going to say, hey, I've got a preset. I'll send it to you. You go ahead and you pop it in uh, on your computer. And this goes in your app data. You can Google it. But if anyone has a question on that, it's just if I show it to you now, nobody's going to remember it because it's something that I always forget and I use this all the time. Um, so that way, if they send you a preset, you can match exactly what that printer is asking for. And when they come back later and say, well, I don't know why this worked out this way, you can say, hey, you're the one who gave me the preset. I, you know, I really expect it to be the way I need it. And in most cases, printers are out there trying to help you do the best job you can. If you are sending a PDF to someone who is doing, uh, it's a professional print shop, but in addition to offset printing, they use a high quality Xerox, or uh, in the industry sometimes they call it a DocuTech system. DocuTech is really more of a brand name, but it means on demand high quality printing, in a way that's what it means. And, and that's a term that people will respond to. I just want to make sure I'm not misleading anyone. So if you say DocuTech, it basically just means I want to get as high quality printing as I can and I want to get it on demand. I don't want to have to print 3,000 of something. I want to be able to print just 200 and I want to get a pretty decent price. When you are using that type of printer, it's not the same technology as offset printing where ink is being applied to a plate and that plate touches the paper. And you all are familiar with a Xerox process and that's what we're talking about with these high-end color printers. 
if it's not offset, sometimes the printer doesn't really want a PDFX because it's not the same type of machinery. They may say, hey, all I need is either press quality, and some of my printers have even said, just send me a high quality print because it has a similar resolution. So again, this is why you need to have that conversation with whoever you're sending it to. And in fact, sometimes it's really nice to have that conversation before you even create the project. Printers will often have special deals if you go with a certain type of paper or a certain size. And some of these things that can save you money aren't going to be a detriment to your design. You can incorporate them. So what if your page is a quarter of an inch wider or it's a not quite so glossy, it's more of a matte finish. You know, sometimes it's going to be perfect for your project. So it's good to find these things out ahead of time so you don't have to go back and modify your design to match maybe a special deal you can get. All right, I'm going to start with high quality print. And then let's go down here to this page range area. In most cases, you're going to be clicking the All button, which means that it is going to create a PDF of all of the pages in the PDF, I mean in the InDesign file. In my case, I've got about a 100 page file and I'm really only interested in pages 24 through 26. So I'm going to change that page range and type in 24 to 26. 24 to 5 to 6, 27. No, I want that to be 27. I want two full spreads. And then it asks you whether you want pages or spreads. A spread is going to mean that this left page and this right page will be glued together as a single PDF page. You will not be able to break them apart. And sometimes printers want that. For instance, I do a newsletter where it is printed on 11 by 17, but I create it by putting two 8 half by 11 sheets together. And when the printer prints this, they want those two pages side by side with no chance of the pages breaking and matching up with another page before or after it. So I will sometimes print these in spreads so that it's two spreads instead of four 8.5 by 11 pages. Otherwise, I leave it at pages because when I view a PDF or I'm sending a PDF out to somebody who needs to review it, Sometimes their monitor is not large enough to see the spread in enough detail, so they're constantly having to zoom in and then zoom back out, zoom in and zoom back out. So unless you have a special reason why you want to print spreads, I usually just stick with pages. I'm going to ignore embed um, page thumbnails. Really, for the most part, you can see those thumbnails in Acrobat. But let's take a look at Optimize for Fast Web View. Most of us have become very web savvy. And we get very impatient when it takes time for things to download. In fact, I have friends who will wait about five seconds, and if something doesn't start happening, they just leave the site. So what this option provides is a way for the PDF to start downloading. Before it's completely done, you'll see the first page. And then it will load the rest of the pages in the background. And that gives the viewer the idea that, okay, yeah, something is happening. Something's not wrong with this site. So I always turn on Optimize for Fast Web View. Creating a tagged PDF has lots of advantages. And even if you don't understand it, it's nice to make sure that that's turned on. It has to do with being able to uh, search a PDF a little bit faster. The other thing is, when we get into accessibility, which I don't believe we're going to be getting into in much detail in this class, accessibility is a big issue today because by law, government agencies must create PDFs that can be used by people with handicaps with their readers, uh, something that will read a PDF out loud, or anything else that's going to, any device that's attached to their computer to help them understand information in a PDF. And without a tagged PDF, it's going to be difficult for that reader to do something with the file. So again, unless there's a reason why we need to turn it off, I usually leave it on. Moving over here to view PDFs after exporting. This is a really big thing that I always 
insist that my students do, at least until they're more experienced with working with this workflow. Sometimes you create a PDF and it gets saved to a location on your hard drive that you don't know where it is. And so you're sitting here searching for this PDF and it just becomes a real hassle. By choosing to view the PDF after exporting, that PDF will come up on your screen, which gives you an opportunity to do a couple of things. First, it allows you to save it to a custom location on your computer that you can determine. Two, you can email a PDF directly from Acrobat because it will open up that file in Acrobat. So for now, this is a real good thing to leave on. If your document has layers and you want those layers to be converted to Acrobat layers, let's say you had a engineering drawing and you needed certain things to be visible on one layer and not on another layer, Acrobat can detect those layers and you can create Acrobat layers, which I don't have multiple layers in this file. If you include in your InDesign document any bookmarks, basically any interactive elements, and that's going to include bookmarks, hyperlinks, non-printing objects, and um, the two on the right are not so interactive. These are just visible things that are normally hidden but you would like them to show up. But on the left, the bookmarks and hyperlinks, as well as you can embed movies in an InDesign file, audio files in an InDesign file. You must turn these on or they, they will not go through to the PDF. So if you ever create a PDF and you're missing some of your interactive elements, just go back and make sure that you create it again and you've got these checkboxes turned on. Okay, that's, the, that's enough for general. Moving to compression. This dialog box at first looks incredibly overwhelming. But just think of it as the exact same command three different times. It's just dealing with three different types of images. The first is for color images. Grayscale images is next. And then monochrome, which means black and white. Because grayscale can have as many levels of gray as a color image has of color. And these two are normally the same, color images and grayscale, but monochrome often we want that to be a much higher resolution. And it's not as much information, so it doesn't impact the size of the file very much. What I want to draw your attention to is the downsampling numbers here. Downsampling means that it will take pixels from an image and throw them away in order to bring the file size down. So for high quality print, it's saying for images that have pixels over 450 pixels per inch, throw anything above 300 away. You'd think it would be throw away anything over 450 away, but basically that's where it's saying it, at the point where you have an image that's 450 pixels or more, you're going to downsample it to 300 guaranteeing that nothing in the file is over uh, 449 pixels per inch. There are several types of commands here that I'm not going to go into. This is really more of an Acrobat class thing, but there are also different types of compression. And different types of images like different types of compression better. You're going to get a better result. But it's really better to go back and take a look at what these compression methods are if you are having to create a PDF that someone is going to be very critical about. For the most part, these defaults are going to work just fine. Let me show you, though, the difference between this compression page and the compression page for smallest file size. You can see these numbers are very different. In this preset, images over 150 pixels per inch are going to be downsampled to 100. And 100 is not anywhere near enough to get a good copy or a printout of, some, of an image. Remember that text is not an image unless it's coming from 
a flattened Photoshop file or some other rasterized input or it's a screen capture. Text will always look really crisp and clean, even in smallest file size, because it's vector based. It's not rasterized. The maps that we're talking about here are raster images. Okay, I'm going to go back to high quality print. And one other thing um, I didn't mention, which I want to mention now, and it's, it's on every single page. Notice that even if I flip pages here, the compatibility is still sitting up here as well as the PDF preset. The compatibility indicates how far back somebody's version of Acrobat will be able to open up this PDF. So for example, if I choose compatibility Acrobat 5, anyone who has Acrobat 4 or less will not be able to open this file. 5 is pretty old. And if you hold down this drop down menu, you can see that it's going all the way up to 8, 9. Even though I'm an Acrobat 11 right at the moment. This is always a trade off. On the one side, if you use too high of a compatibility, anybody with an old version of Acrobat will not be able to open it. On the other hand, the reader, the most current reader, is always free to anyone who wants to download it from the Adobe website. And I used to be pretty impatient with people who had older versions of the reader. But as I worked with more companies and found out that often the IT departments don't allow individuals to load items on their computers. They have to wait for IT to do it. And sometimes that's a couple years before that happens, especially in my government clients. I'm a little bit more uh, patient and a little more flexible about what compatibility I choose. You want to try to stay above 5 because this is really where there was a benchmark for transparencies and special effects. And if you go behind uh, under that, you might have a few problems. As you increase the compatibility to a more current version, it will be able to do more things. For instance, you have higher security if you add security. So you know, you're going to have to find where that magic line is that is the most current Acrobat version you can get away with, and then what people will need to access a file with. So I'm going to go back and just say I'm going to choose 7. 7 was, um, will you figure 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, what it's four versions ago. All right, let's go to the next page here. Marks and bleeds. If you are sending, sending a document that is going to have a bleed attached to it, then you're going to need some sort of printer mark that will indicate crops and registration marks, especially if it's going to be a four color print job. And again, getting your input from your printer is going to be very helpful in trying to determine this information. So um, this would mean that you're going to get all printer marks. I usually am just putting in crops and registration. The registration marks are those little circles with the little lines that go through it that help printers align uh, color plates. But again, and I can't say this enough, uh, make sure you check with your printer. The rest of these uh, for output advanced and We'll talk a moment about security, but I'm going to just go over this briefly. If you've chosen a PDF X, then you might want to um, I don't know, you may want to consider looking into these, but again, your printer will give you more information about that. At, at this point, just leave it at the default. There's a little button here called Ink Manager. And I know I've mentioned this previously. The, you can access the Ink Manager in InDesign before you ever export it to a PDF. But if you're in the PDF export, you can also access it. And in this particular case, the reason I wanted to bring this up is to show you, I talked about this in an earlier webcast. I have four process colors, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, but I also have well, actually, I have several spot colors here. 
some of them came in with the images. This 1Q1T is a color that has been defined by some image that I brought into InDesign. But these four I created, the yellow, blue, Pantone 45. So if I want to convert all spots to process, I click this button down here in the bottom left hand corner. And notice that the little icon that was a little spot now turns into a, a four-sided pinwheel, which is the universal symbol for CMYK. So even without going to press quality, notice I'm still in high quality print, I can convert these to CMYK colors. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off just for the moment. The only thing I want to mention on the advanced is that if you want your font to be accessible and viewable in the PDF document that you are sending out, you are going to want to embed the font. Now, it used to be that we had the choice of saying, well, I want to embed all my characters in my fonts, or I only want to embed in certain characters. But now that we have open type fonts, really the only choice you have going out of InDesign is that you can subset fonts, which is always going to be the case when the percent of characters used is less than 100%. And that's because now that open type fonts can have 65,000 characters, you would just kill Acrobat as it tried to churn through all of that information. So that means that when someone opens up that PDF, if they do not have that font loaded on their system, they will be able to see those characters accurately. But if they wanted to try to edit the PDF, a message will come up and say, I'm sorry, you do not have this font. A replacement will be chosen. In most cases, if it's just a standard serif or sans serif, for instance, I'm looking at a serif font back here in the background right below this little cute little penguin, you will have a hard time telling the replacement font from the font that's actually in the file. But if it's a real specialized graphic font, like a serif -y font or something that looks like calligraphy, that's not going to look good because it's going to replace it with a standard serif or sans serif. It would be like replacing this beautiful calligraphy character with Times New Roman. Right? It's not going to have the same effect. So you want to be sure you're subsetting these fonts. Um, and that's the best you can do, but always be sure that that's what it's doing. And by default, coming from InDesign, you are going to embed a subset of the fonts, but coming from other applications, that's not always the case. You can secure a PDF at this level without owning Acrobat. And I'm not going to go into the details of this, but I normally don't apply security coming out of InDesign to Acrobat. I usually wait until it's a PDF file and then I go into Acrobat Pro or Acrobat Standard, and I create a, a secure document. And that can be a password protected where it's password protected so that you can't open it without a password, or using a password to restrict editing, which means um, I don't want anyone to be able to copy things out of my, this PDF or extract pages. Um, the only thing they're allowed to do, I have to choose one of these. And often I want to choose either filling in forms and signing or commenting, filling in form fields and signing, if that's what the purpose of this PDF is. But again, I, I don't want to go into too much detail on this. It's really more of an Acrobat thing. And if people have questions about it, I can definitely send a link with movies that you can watch on this. All right, if you are creating a PDF for a very long document, Starting with CS5, InDesign will process that PDF in the background so that you can go back and work in InDesign. Now, that's what is supposed to happen. I, I have had a few problems with that. And I find if I try to go back into InDesign, I'm getting lags in time. So you'll just have to see how bad that is on your system. And I'm sure it's going to keep getting better. It's, it's a little bit better in CS6. And as we go forward, I'm sure that as computers processing speeds increase, 
it, it's always going to be better. And that's really how software manufacturers look at the world. You talk to some of these software engineers and they say, well, yeah, of course, the technology is not there right now for what we're trying to do, but the next generation will be able to do it. And that's what they plan for. It just means if you're still sitting around with a six-year-old laptop, it's going to be chunking along trying to catch up. All right. I have created um, a few PDFs, and we're going to look at those sizes in just a moment. I want to make one comment about this font issue going back to advanced. Whoops, I don't want a password. If you get a font, let's say in the summary, you find that some font is not um, going to embed. And I have a font earlier. Let me go back to general so that I can click on all for just a moment because then we'll see we should see a warning. It's not coming through because I do have a font that doesn't want to be embedded. And usually you'll see a little yellow triangle here, and you'll see the warning listed down in this box here. And it may say something about that this font will not embed. And you've got to really go back then into the InDesign file and think about how you're going to deal with this. Do you risk it? Even if it can't embed, when you open it up on your system, if you have that font loaded, it's going to look fine. But the person who doesn't have the font is the one who's going to see the difference in that PDF. If you can't find a substitute font that works, there is one thing you can do, and I'm going to just show you real quickly how that is done. This is the way we used to handle things when we used to have a lot more font errors. Those days are over and we don't use this method very often, but if you have a real specialty font that's for just a few characters, this is how you can get around it. Now this font works absolutely fine. This is, um, what is this? This is Minion Pro, but I'm just going to use this as an example. Well, actually, let me do something else here. Um, let me choose something that's much more stylized. You don't have to see this flipping. I know it's probably a huge blur. Uh, let's do this one. Okay. So you can see that this has all kinds of little swoops and curves. And let's say that this was a free font I downloaded off of the font, and it just didn't want to embed. I can click on this text box, go to my type menu, and I can choose the command create outlines. What this does is it just converted it from type to a vector image. And I can't edit it any longer. In fact, real quickly, I'm just going to make a copy of this and then go back and do that again. So type menu, create outline. And I'm going to zoom way in here, click on this image, and you can see the point now creating the curves. And I can click on one you know, point, and I can edit this if I want to. Of course, it's going to look awful, but um, just to show you that this can only be edited now as a piece of art, not as something that I can use my type tool. My type tool won't even recognize this anymore. But from a printing standpoint, it's going to be pretty hard for someone to see the difference between this and this. And let me get this on a page real quickly. Um, let me just create a new master page here. No, sorry. I'm just copying this and I'm going to paste it on this last page. And then I'm going to go into preview. And um, let's just take a look at what my display performance is. And you can see that it looks very clean, very sharp. But as I drag my cursor over the top, you can see how it's reacting as a piece of art rather than as something that's been created with a font. There is one other thing that we can do. I'm going to go ahead and delete this page. Um, when you're creating a PDF, and this is an alternative to InDesign's presentation view. We've talked about the, the presentation view and the fact that 
you could give a slide presentation using InDesign in presentation mode, but when people are on the road, often they don't know what computer they may be presenting on, and it's much easier to just grab a PDF file. And we can do this using InDesign and creating some interactive elements. And I just want to show you this real quickly. So here's this uh, slideshow, which should look familiar to all of you since this is one of our labs. And we can go into a panel. And this is with interactive, and it's called Page Transitions. And essentially it is like PowerPoint page transitions, and you have a choice of applying any one of these transitions to your pages. And when you do that, you will see that there's a little page trans transition icon applied over here on the right. So I've applied a transition to each one of these pages. Uh, this one was blind, and I can see a little tiny preview. It's really hard to see, and I'm not sure if it's going to be redrawing clearly for yours. Let's go to page two. Is the comb? I don't know if you guys can see that. And then for the third transition, I chose white. Let's see if I can get that to do it again. So I'm seeing a little preview of what that transition will do. And now when I export this to a PDF, as I move from one page to the next, that transition will be the view I see going from page 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. So it, it's really easy. The file size is very small. And I know a lot of salespeople that this is what they take on a little thumb drive or USB drive when they go places. Instead of worrying about bringing a PowerPoint presentation and having something go wrong with the software, they just bring the PDF file. All they need is the free reader in order to run it on any computer. So for what it's worth, um, well, I'm going to bring up that presentation that I exported it as. And again, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but um, because I know a lot of you are having redraw issues on your end, but just to show you. So here's presentation mode. You can see there's nothing that indicates that this is Adobe Acrobat. And if I click anywhere on that side area, you'll see that it goes to the next page. And with each page, I get a transition. Now that was too small to see. I'm going to go page up. But yeah, it's not coming through, at least on my second monitor. It's so chunky you guys can't see it. So you'll have to play with this. I, would, I really hope that you guys will um, play with this feature and see if it's something that might work for you. Getting back to our PDF file sizes, I want to show you this Finder view. I've got three versions of that demo file. The smallest file size is only a little over 2.5 megs. Moving up to high quality, it's over 10 megs. And the demo file press quality, remember we talked about these three presets, these three presets that I have not made any changes to in this case. Um, that's over 15. There's no way I'm going to attach this to an email not knowing exactly who I'm sending it to. Uh, we all know that Gmail accepts pretty high files, or uh, pretty big files. But sometimes I will try to send something to a company I'm working with, and they have a limit of 6 or 10 megs. So it's a little bit of bad etiquette to send things that are beyond what the company can accept through their firewall. So just keep this in mind. That's a huge difference. But the quality between this file small, small size and the press quality or the high quality is going to be substantial if that person is going to print that to a pretty decent quality printer. All right. So in review of this, I want to bring this slide back. Let me quickly get this back up here. And I think Acrobat wants to crash at this point. Let's hope it doesn't. It can just hang on another second. Okay, let me just bring this back over here. This is the slide that we started this week with. And 
I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here so we can see this a little clearer. I'm hoping now after this week's webcast, and I still have a font webcast to do before Thursday night, but in looking at this, I'm hoping that this slide makes a lot more sense. As we mentioned earlier, we're working with all the inputs that are going to go into an InDesign file. And then from that InDesign file, what is the route you are going to have to take? I think printing and packaging now should seem pretty familiar. And let's look at these last two down here. This is just the difference between two PDF versions of a file. Because remember, a PDF can you can make what? You know, fifty different PDFs of different quality with different specifications from one InDesign file. And that's really the beauty of PDF. I have several clients who have to create, let's say, the county budget. I do work for the county to help them get their budget book out. One version of that 400-page book goes into a high-quality PDF that is sent to the printer for those copies that have to be printed as books. Another version of the PDF gets sent out with very low res, and that is put on the county website so that individuals like you and me from the public can go up and say, hey, I want to know how this department in the county is dealing with their budget. In addition to that, you also have the option, which I didn't cover in detail tonight, but you have the option of saying, if I have a book, and a book feature inside of InDesign means that, that you have a book file that points to several in individual InDesign files. You can create a PDF of that entire book where it puts all of those sections into one PDF file, or you can opt out and say, no, I'd really rather have the PDF get broken up into those sections that have been added to my book file. So as confusing as that may sound, I'm hoping that you're seeing that the possibilities of what you can do with a PDF are enormous. And it's really going to depend upon your need and the need of whoever it is you are trying to communicate that file to. All right. That's it for creating a PDF. As always, please send me any questions or comments to either the blog or by email. Until the next webcast, signing off.